Father, your precepts are right, rejoicing the heart. Your commandments are pure, enlightening our eyes. Spirit, we need you to enlighten our eyes this morning. Cause us to see Jesus as more beautiful and believable. Make us more keenly aware of our sin and draw us to yourself again that we might repent and believe in the gospel. Grant us repentant hearts that lead us to incomparable joy in you. Amen. Well, imagine with me for a moment that you perceive of yourself to be in good physical health. I'm not talking about good shape, like the type of guy who smiles as you jog up Mount Sentinel, you know who you are. But I'm talking about good health, no major illnesses that you know of. Now imagine that you've scheduled a routine checkup with your doctor. And you go to your appointment, and everything seems to be going just fine. And then your doctor says to you, hey, good news, there's a cure. Your response to what your doctor says is determined uh, by what you perceive of your health to be. You think you're in good shape. You don't know that you have any sort of disease, so you reject the treatment. But imagine a different scenario in which you have been struggling with an illness for years and years and years. You've had countless appointments with specialists, blood work, tests, scans, all of them pointing to an incurable illness. In this scenario, you're headed to another one of your many appointments, and you're expecting still more of the same bad news. And maybe this scenario feels all too familiar to you. This time, imagine your doctor comes in and she has a hopeful smile on her face. This time, she reveals that there is a new treatment option. It is all but guaranteed that it will wipe out the disease that's been attacking your body for years. Don't you think that you might receive this good news a little bit differently than the news in the first scenario? Even if there was a difficult and painful journey of treatment ahead, knowing that there was a cure, you'd be hopeful. Well, sometimes, well-meaning Christians start a presentation of the gospel with something like, Jesus loves you and died for your sins. But the problem is, without a right understanding of the bad news of our sin in front of a holy and just God, the good news of the gospel makes no sense to anyone. You can't possibly want the cure unless you know you have the disease. And in today's text, there are a group of people who have no idea how incredibly sick they are. They are beyond delusional about their proximity to God, thinking that because of their ethnic heritage and their religious practices, that they are God's true people. And we're looking at two parallel parables today as in these two stories that work together to communicate the same big idea that Jesus seeks, saves, and celebrates repentant sinners. And we're going to look at that in three points. So first, we're going to look at the necessity of repentance, where we consider who it is that's lost and who, therefore, needs to repent. And then we're going to look at the agent of repentance, as in who it is that seeks the lost and brings them to repentance, And lastly, we'll look at the joy of repentance, where we'll look at three different types of joy in this passage that come from repenting. Now, before we read the passage again, uh, I want to ask you guys to do something with me. I want to ask you to listen really carefully to the 10 verses that we're going to read, uh, because a parable is a little bit different than a lot of the texts that we'll go through. A lot of times we'll read a passage and then as we walk through our points, it will be like verses one and two communicate this point, verses two and three, three and four communicate this point. But the point of the parable is seen in the whole story. So I want to ask you to listen really carefully because we won't reference specific verses throughout quite as much as we usually do. So here we go. Luke 15 verses one through 10, one more time. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until it is found, or until he finds it? And when he has found it, 
he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she's found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So first, we're going to look at the necessity of repentance. At first brush with these verses, it would be natural to draw some conclusions about the meaning. In fact, I would guess that if you've heard a sermon on this passage before, you may have heard that the main point is Jesus' relentless love for the individual. You may have even heard that famous quote in relation to this passage, that if you were the only person on earth, Jesus still would have come and died for you. After all, he leaves the 99 in search of the one lost sheep. And there are certainly elements of what I just said that are true. But is that the primary thing that Jesus wants us to see in this passage? This is where careful Bible reading can help us out. I want to draw our attention first to who Jesus' audience is here. There are two groups of people mentioned in the first few verses who are drawing near to Jesus. One group draws near to hear his teaching, and the other group draws near to criticize and question. The first group are tax collectors and sinners. In Luke 14, at the end of the passage that Paul preached last week, Do you remember Jesus' final words after his hard teaching on the cost of following him? He said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And it would seem in our passage, the sinners and tax collectors who are drawing near to hear Jesus are the most receptive group, the most receptive to Jesus' teaching. But there's a second group of people who are coming near to Jesus. That's the Pharisees and scribes, the religious elite. They come to Jesus not to hear, but to grumble and complain about his proximity to these sinners. Notice the language of the Pharisees in verse 2. This man receives sinners and eats with them. Now, in our world, it's hard to imagine someone making a fuss over something like this. As Tyler mentioned a few weeks back, our culture has a sort of theoretical category for this kind of hospitality. Though more often than not, I would guess that we like the idea more than the practice of it. But in Middle Eastern culture, hospitality was and is a huge deal. For a person to receive another person carries with it the weight of belonging and affectionate care. At the time, a prominent person in a town or village might have opened their table to feed people in need, but rarely, if ever, would they actually sit down and eat with a person of a different status or station than them. It would diminish their place in society. They would be viewed as lowly if they associated with the lowly. And here, Jesus condescends yet again to be seen eating and receiving, eating with, not eating, eating with and receiving tax collectors and sinners, those viewed as unclean. And in Luke so far, the Pharisees have already been rattled by Jesus' teaching, uh, by his claims that he's equal with God. And now, to add insult to injury, This man who is claiming equality with God is dining with people who are unclean. They're dirty. They're outsiders. So Luke records these parables, these two stories that we just read, as Jesus' response to the Pharisees. The Pharisees and scribes are the target audience of this passage, not primarily the tax collectors and sinners. And this changes how we look for the meaning here. So in both the lost sheep and the lost coin, we're presented with something that is not where it's supposed to be. Let's consider what lostness looks like for each, the sheep, both the sheep and the coin. Now, I'm not a shepherd. I didn't do 4-H growing up, like some of you in here. And I haven't spent that much time around sheep. But I'm led to believe that sheep are generally helpless creatures. A sheep strayed from the flock is vulnerable. And being in a dangerous setting, the sheep is going to lay down and surrender to the hopelessness of the situation. Apart from the protection and guiding of the shepherd, the sheep is destined to wander aimlessly, suffer attack by predators, and eventually die. 
And Jesus pointedly describes people this way in Matthew 9, 36, where he looks out at the crowds of lost people around him and he sees them as harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Well, in the lost coin, the woman sets out with a light and her cleaning supplies to search and sweep every dark corner of the house to find an inanimate object. I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence here, but coins aren't alive. They have no will to do anything, and even if they did, they have no legs to move them where they might want to go. A lost coin can't make itself be found. It is lost. This coin didn't have an air tag on it so that it could be located by an iPhone. Uh, Apart from the illumination and scouring of the house by someone, this coin will be lost forever. So what are we to see about the state of both the sheep and the coin, and what does that tell us about people? Both the sheep and the coin are helplessly, hopelessly lost. Both are unable by any stretch of the imagination to improve their situation without outside intervention. Both are as good as dead and headed for destruction. The Apostle Paul, in one of the most quoted chapters of the Bible here at Sovereign Hope, describes us similarly. Look with me at Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, where Paul says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Well, notice who Paul is referring to here. Wouldn't it be nice if he went on to say, I'm not talking about you guys. I'm talking about Hitler. Hitler. That guy was dead in his trespasses and sins. Or I'm talking about that that bully from school. She's clearly a child of wrath, not like you. But Paul, led by the Holy Spirit, makes it personal. We were all dead in our trespasses and sins, living like mindless zombies, driven only by our flesh, in pursuit of our selfish desires, inadvertently following Satan, children of wrath like the rest of every single other person on the planet. No one gets a pass here. But back in our text, we have a third group of people that are presented aside from the lost sheep and the lost coin. And that's the 99 sheep and the nine coins. What about these ones that aren't lost? Maybe you already noticed the odd language that Jesus uses in verse 7 of our passage when he says, 99 persons, righteous persons, who need no repentance. I hope that your theology antenna went up there. Who could possibly be called righteous with no need for repentance? Paul says in Romans 3.10 that none are righteous, no one does good. And in Romans 3.23, a little bit later, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Or what about 1 John 1.8, where the Holy Spirit tells us through the Apostle John, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Are Paul and John somehow contradicting what Jesus says here? Or what if Jesus is using intentional irony to further drive the point home to his audience? It's like he's saying, as if there were 99 righteous persons who need no repentance, This would be like me saying, as if you could drive down the street to the good food store and see zero Subaru wagons in the parking lot. (laughs) This is an impossible scenario. The 99 righteous don't exist. The clear and consistent testimony of Luke's gospel so far has been the universal necessity of repentance. This text is no different. So why does Jesus say it at all? Well, because the Pharisees truly believe that they are the 99. Their self-righteous perception is that they have perfectly kept the law. They have distanced themselves from what is unclean. What could they possibly have to repent for? He was telling the Pharisees that day, no matter how much bacon you don't eat, no matter how much you disassociate yourself from what and whom you perceive to be unclean, no matter how long and lofty your public prayers are, no matter how strictly you keep the law, There is no joy in heaven over a self-righteous rule follower. God does not delight in the proud who think 
they don't need to repent. He was calling the Pharisees to repent. And Jesus calls us to repent today. No matter how good you think you are, no matter how many memory verses you chalked up in your childhood, no matter how often you're in the church building, no matter what curse words you don't use, no matter how removed from the world you are, there is no joy in heaven over a self-righteous rule follower who thinks they don't need to repent. God does not delight in our proud sense of superiority over others. He is calling you and I to repent today. Before we move on, I want to point out that God is not somehow more prone to love the blatant worldly sinners than the religious ones. Despite the fact that the call in our passage today to repentance is primarily to the Pharisees, the sinners and tax collectors don't get a pass. Their sin is not downplayed. Notice that Jesus doesn't say to the Pharisees, God hates your pride more than he hates the extortion and abuse of the tax collectors. What they're doing isn't so bad. He doesn't say that. He says that heaven celebrates these sinners not just showing up to be near Jesus, but repenting. Both the obvious sinners as well as the Pharisees are lost and bound for an eternity apart from God in hell. Both groups are called to the same repentance and faith in Christ. Well, I wonder which of these groups you most identify with. The outcast or the self-righteous? The sheep and the coin who know they're lost or the 99 who think that they're good? I'd like to speak to the kids in the room for a moment. Growing up with parents who love Jesus, is it difficult for you to see your sin? Do you see how hard it is to obey your mom and dad and to love your siblings? Or do you see the kids around you at school or in your neighborhood and think, I'm not as bad as they are? Do you know that Jesus calls you to repent today? Jesus' call to people who know they're bad and to people who think they're good is to repent. Jesus calls all of us to turn from our sin and believe in the gospel. And maybe you're wondering how you can do any of this. Maybe it sounds impossible to walk away from the sin that your heart loves. Maybe it sounds impossible to walk away from your pride. It's because it is. You will never come to God on your own, and you will never put that pet sin to death on your own. We were all dead in our trespasses and sins. We were all wandering in the wilderness, and we were all lost, lying helpless in a dark corner, destined for the wrath of God but there's good news in our second point. And that's where we look at the agent of repentance. How does what is lost come to be found? How does the sheep get returned to the safety of its owner? And how does the coin get restored to the woman? Well, the order of what happens in both the sheep and the coin is important. The sheep does not cry out for help. The coin does not roll itself to the light. Both are sought out by someone. The shepherd goes after the one that is lost until he finds it, refusing to rest until the sheep is restored to its flock. This is a rescue mission. The woman lights a lamp. She sweeps the house, gets on her hands and knees, and seeks diligently until she finds the coin. And while it may have sounded passive in verse 1 that Jesus receives sinners, here we're given an image of an all-consuming hunt. This is anything but passive. Passive. This is the active pursuit of the lost until it is found and returned home. The shepherd in our text willingly and joyfully puts himself in harm's way for the sake of the lost. As he goes out into the dangerous wild to find it, see what he does when he comes to the sheep? Does he call it to himself from a distance? Does he try to lure it to himself with treats? No, he goes to the sheep, he picks it up, and he puts it on his shoulders. Now, I'm not a hunter, but I do plan to use two hunting illustrations today. Hopefully that resonates with you outdoorsmen out there. Well, after successfully bringing down a large animal like an elk, some guys will call a buddy with a four-wheeler or a horse to come help them uh, pack it out. Well, not one of our members, not Mark Southall. Now, this guy is way too masculine for that. Mark quarters these things up, and he carries them out on his shoulders like our shepherd. I asked him this week uh, what the furthest he's had to hike with an elk on his back was. It was three and a half miles. Now, that might not sound like very far to some of you, but consider the burning in your shoulders 
the stiffness in your neck, the fatigue in your legs as every muscle in your body works together to get that bull out to your truck on your back. Up and down hills and valleys, through brush and mud, constantly aware that at any moment, a mountain lion or grizzly could smell dinner and come knocking. Mark said every time he does it, he thinks he's going to see Jesus. I'm assuming he means like he could die from exhaustion. You can ask him afterwards. But for some reason, he continues to do it. He might tell you something different, but I am guessing his motivation is joy. Mark loves to hunt. He loves to be in the woods, searching for the animals that he knows are out there. He continues to endure the struggle and strain of the trek out of the woods once he's found one because it brings him joy. In our passage, the pursuit of the sheep is joy for the shepherd. Even in the difficult, strenuous, and painful journey it's going to take to get the sheep home, look at Hebrews 12 too. Look how it describes Jesus. Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, not just a hike out of the woods, endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Here we see that Jesus is the joyful agent of our repentance. For joy, he endured the agony of the cross to find the lost and bring us home. It was his delight to suffer and die to redeem us sinners. In his resurrection and by the power of his spirit, he initiates, he draws, he woos. He's the one who gives life to us. He picks us up and throws us on his shoulders. He gives us the appetite to repent and believe. He sustains our faith. He helps us to obey daily. He carries us back to the safety of his fold. This is why he came. In John 10, 11, Jesus calls himself our good shepherd. In Luke 19, 10, he tells us plainly that the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Not to make himself available if we're interested. Not to passively sit back and wait for us to come. He knows we won't. He came to seek and save. He is the only way to the repentance that we all desperately need, and he is the only way to the peace of being found. But it's still possible for us to miss the point of what Jesus is doing here. He wants us to see that repentance is not only necessary, but it is the way, the only way to joy. And that's our third point today, the joy of repentance. Both parables highlight the significance of the return of the lost item and the joy that follows it. There are five references to joy and rejoicing in these 10 verses. So we're going to look at three types of joy that come from repentance that are either clear or inferred in our passage today. First, I want to look at the personal joy of repentance. Wherever they came from before, the sheep now know no other identity but belonging to the shepherd. That means safety, security, peace, and freedom. Listen to how Jesus speaks of his sheep in John 10, 27 to 30. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. If being found and returned to the flock necessarily involves repenting, look at what you get when you turn from your sin to Christ. You get the guiding voice of Jesus, our good shepherd. He knows us, so we follow him. He gives us eternal life where we will never perish. No one can touch us. No one can snatch us from Jesus' sovereign hand. Our Father gave us to Jesus. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, and he is greater than all. No one can touch us. We're, firm, or we're held firmly in his safe grip. Jesus is one with the Father. Therefore, his grip is as tight and as strong as the Father's grip on us. And because of the cross, we're not only received by Jesus, but the triune God will hold and sustain us, never letting us go. Does that astonish you this morning? Listen to how the author Dane Ortland puts it. He says, we cannot present a reason for Christ to finally close off his heart to his own sheep. No such reason exists. Every human friend has a limit. 
if we offend enough, if a relationship gets damaged enough, if we betray enough times, we are cast out, the walls go up. With Christ, our sins and weaknesses are the very resume items that qualify us to approach him. Nothing but coming to him is required, first at conversion and a thousand times thereafter until we are with him upon death. It's possible that even as a believer this morning, you feel like you've been left to wander aimlessly and wonder where God is in your trials. This parable leaves room for that. It leaves room for what's normal to the human experience of feeling lost. But if you are a Christian today, remember that no matter how it feels, you have actually, finally, and decisively been found by Jesus. He will carry you on his shoulders until the day you die and you see him face to face. In Deuteronomy 1.31, listen to how God's relationship to his people is described, even in spite of their rebellion. Look what God tells Israel. The Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son all the way that you went until you came to this place. The only response that makes any sense to his shepherd and care is to turn again to him in repentance and faith, trusting him to carry you all the way through whatever you're going through. It's your only shot at joy. Now let's look at the communal joy of repentance. And this idea might be harder for us to grasp as rugged individualistic Montanans, but in Middle Eastern culture, there is a lot of shared life and responsibility in the community. Nothing happened in isolation. Most of the little activities of day-to-day life would have affected the community as a whole. So therefore, there was a shared, oh, sorry, uh, It would have been rare, actually, in this time for an individual to own a flock of 100 sheep. Uh, Commentators tell us that. More than likely, this flock that Jesus describes would have been owned by like multiple families or individuals in the community. And therefore, there would have been this shared responsibility for the collective group of 100 sheep. Each shepherd uh, that was there would have had some investment in the group as a whole. And when one went missing, the responsible party would have gone out and they might, have, they might bear the unique responsibility of tracking it down. However, the whole community would feel the loss. The whole community would be concerned for the well-being of not just the sheep, but also the shepherd as he went out to seek for it. So they stand in the road, almost holding their breath, watching and waiting for their friend and neighbor to return home with his lost sheep. Imagine their joy when on the horizon, they make out the outline of the shepherd slowly trudging along, not by himself, but with the sheep in tow. Then the shepherd calls for a block party. He doesn't care how exhausted he is. His work is finished and it's time to celebrate. Rejoice with me, he calls out. Well, we don't have time to address the coin in detail, uh, but this coin that Jesus refers to is a Greek drachma worth approximately a day's wage. So if this woman only had 10 of them, we're talking about a person whose entire investment portfolio doesn't get her very far into retirement, right? It's gone quickly. When there's a sense of interdependence among friends and neighbors in a community, when an individual loses something valuable, it is a loss to the whole village. Upon discovering the coin, she calls for a block party. She doesn't care that it's probably late since it's dark out. The coin has been found. Rejoice with me, she calls out. In the same way, we ought to rejoice in our salvation together. Nothing in our life occurs in a vacuum. Both our sin and our salvation affect those around us. We aren't just saved from our sins, but we're actually saved into God's family in the church. He has purchased a people for his own possession, not just individual persons. When was the last time that you had someone over and asked them how they came to know Christ? Did you rejoice together over the fact that you were both once lost, but have now been found? A few years ago, with no prior introduction, I met Matt Calderon, one of our members. I met him on YouTube, actually. And I hope you've had the privilege of seeing the video that I'm talking about. If you haven't, ask me afterwards. Well, Matt had just taken down this big bull elk during archery season while out hunting with his brother. And as they recount the story, he and his brother keep praising God for bringing them not only the elk, but even the opportunity to share the gospel with some fellow hunters while they're out here. It's, it's a pretty cool story. Well, their joy is evident as they laugh and shout and smile all the way through the video. 
I will actually pay you $5 if you can watch it all the way through without cracking a smile. Uh, even without knowing Matt at the time, without knowing who he was, I felt this shared sense of joy with Matt. It was contagious. If we can experience that kind of joy over a dead elk, shouldn't we rejoice all the more at dead sinners brought to life in the gospel? What was your experience with the last baptism that took place here? The reason that we do baptism the way that we do is so that the whole church might witness the public outworking of the gospel in someone's life. We get to see and celebrate Jesus' saving power firsthand when people are baptized. We get to rejoice together at the lost being found. So last time we baptized a brother or sister in Christ, did you celebrate God's amazing work of bringing another repentant sinner home into his family? Or did it leave you unfazed? I pray that Sovereign Hope Church is known as a people who regularly celebrate God's work in each other's lives. And there's one last type of joy associated with repentance in this passage, and that is heavenly joy, the heavenly joy of repentance. In verse seven of our passage, we see the following. Jesus says, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And again in verse 10, he says, just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus tells us something extremely profound here. All of heaven celebrates when sinners repent. The triune God and his angels take joy in our salvation. Have you ever considered the implications of that? Johnny and I were talking this week about how sometimes knowing how sinful we are causes us to overemphasize our wormness, our sort of dirtiness. Even after believing the gospel, We can continue to view ourselves like God just tolerates us because that's how we would respond to our enemies if we forgave them. But listen to how Dane Ortland describes it again. He says, the high and holy Christ does not cringe at reaching out and touching dirty sinners and numbed sufferers. Such embrace is precisely what he loves to do. He cannot bear to hold back. We naturally think of Jesus touching us the way a little boy reaches out to touch a slug for the first time. Face screwed up, cautiously extending an arm, giving a yelp of disgust upon contact, and instantly withdrawing. This is why we need a Bible. Our natural intuition can only give us a God like us. Amen. We need the Bible. Here in Luke 15, the word of God spoken by the incarnate Son of God makes clear today that heaven celebrates every single person who repents and believes in the gospel. Look where else we see heavenly celebrating in scripture, just to get a pulse on what causes heaven to erupt in worship. In Luke 2, verses 13 to 14, this famous Christmas passage, a multitude of angels shows up over a field of shepherds, praising God, saying glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace among those, those with whom he is pleased. Or look at Revelation 5, 11 to 13. John records the following. He says, Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. The same angels that sang and shouted at the birth of the Good Shepherd, the same angels who thunderously praise him for his worthiness because of his death in our place, those same angels take joy in your repentance. Jesus gets the glory because he drew you He wooed you. He carried you on his shoulders. He led you to repent. You didn't do it on your own. There is singing and shouting and rejoicing in heaven over our repentance, not because we're worthy, but because of the worthiness of the one who makes our repentance possible. I want to close with a few points of application. First and most obvious is to repent. Have you considered yourself part of the 99 without acknowledging your need? 
Or have you viewed yourself as a sinner or a tax collector who is too far gone? Jesus says in John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. The call to repentance and joy that follows is to everyone. So if you're with us and you've never turned from your sin and trusted Christ, I beg you to come to Jesus today. If you're here and you've been a believer for a long time, maybe you're a member here. The call is still to repent. Repentance and faith aren't just the doorway to the Christian life. They are the whole house. We continue to repent and believe every day. And we're actually going to practice the first step in repentance when we confess our sins together in a moment. Even when we sing the song that we're about to, repent and believe, we're singing that to ourselves just as much as we're singing that to each other and to the lost in our lives. Secondly, if you're a Christian here this morning, having been found by our shepherd Jesus, shouldn't this passage lead us to seek the lost in our lives? Do we get down on our hands and knees with the flashlight of the gospel? Do we leave the safety and security of our friends and our community groups to go after our non-Christian friends and family members to bring them the good news? First, with your lost friends, family, and coworkers who are sick and dying in their sin, have you ever considered that you might be the only person in their life who has the cure? When I share the gospel, you would not believe the number of people who grew up adjacent to the church or people who currently know Christians. And when I share, they say something like, well, I had no idea this is what the Bible taught. If you're unsure where to start with evangelism, come talk to me or talk to one of the elders Uh, Talk to someone you know who actually shares the gospel. We would love to help you think through how to approach those conversations. Well, finally, Habakkuk 2.14 tells us that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And yet today, there are over 3 billion people living in places with no knowledge of the glory of the Lord. The reality of the lostness here ought to keep us awake at night. These three billion people will never experience the joy of repentance unless someone gives up the safety and security of house and home to seek them out like Jesus sought all of us out. Have you ever considered if God might call you to uproot your life and go? I pray that God would break our hearts this morning for the lost in our lives and across the globe and that we would be a church that has so thoroughly experienced the joy of being found in repentance that we could not help but go and tell others they can have that same joy. Please pray with me. Father, we praise you for not leaving us to wander and die in our sin. Jesus, we praise you for seeking us out when we were hopelessly lost, and we praise you for saving us through your work on the cross. Spirit, help us to respond to the gospel daily in repentance and faith and to go and call others to the joy we've found in being found by you. Amen.